Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics. In today's video, I'll be going over many methods and most of the equipment I use to test my robots. If you aren't new here, you're probably aware that I test a lot, and I mean a lot. Probably a lot more than most builders. Why do I do this? Because robots are expensive, events are rare, especially now, and losing sucks. But what sucks a lot worse than having your robot beaten by another robot is having your robot beaten by itself. Now before we get into things with this video, I need to announce that due to the current level of COVID risk, I decided it isn't quite safe enough to go to Norwalk next weekend. I know many others are still going, and this may come as a shock, but I cannot just think about myself. I have to commute to work every day, and my workplace is full of those who are or could be at risk. At some point in the next few weeks, I'll still make a video about what I bring with me to events, and I'll be looking to compete again when it feels safer. So, back to testing. There are two main purposes for testing anything, really. These two purposes are benchmarking and failure analysis. This extends far beyond the world of combat robotics into consumer electronics and product development, stuff I do in the real world as a professional mechanical engineer. Benchmarking is exactly what it always is. Figuring out what the performance of a device actually is under various scenarios and with standard repeatable conditions. For robots, this means figuring out the robot's top speed, how well it can be controlled, how fast it can accelerate or steer, how fast the weapon spins, and what the spin-up time is, etc. All of those things can be easily observed and thus they can be measured. Failure analysis, however, can be a lot more complex and is something that in the real engineering world often involves an extremely meticulous process that as a hobbyist I greatly simplify with many shortcuts. I don't do a lot of failure analysis because it is necessarily expensive. However, it's sometimes the only way to find the true limits of a component, especially where electronics are concerned. I never want to find out about a flaw in my design in the box if I could have rooted it out beforehand. Sometimes, sacrificing a speed controller to the robot gods is just what you've got to do to make sure you don't break it in the arena. What can we benchmark? You might be surprised that with as little as a smartphone camera and free software, you can actually measure a number of things to a very accurate degree. This includes, but is not limited to, robot driving speed, robot acceleration, spinning weapon spin-up time, spinner max RPM, and wheel RPM. With pretty affordable equipment, we can also measure many other things. Scale robot and part weights, torque of a servo or motor, robot traction slash pushing force, tachometer, real motor RPM, real motor KV, wheel RPM or max wheel speed, weapon RPM, multimeter, motor or servo current draw, battery current draw or whole robot current draw, rough percent battery used in X minutes, power meter, Peak motor current or stall current. Accurate current and power measurements. Total robot current draw. Current versus weapon throttle. Battery amp hours or watt hours drain in X minutes. Laser thermometer. How hot do my motors and ESCs get? Does any component need a heat sink, vents, or fans? Do I have a failing bearing? Will this part get too hot for touching PLA? What part is generating all of that heat? Proper enclosed test box. Full on weapon and drive tests. Does the robot break when hitting stuff? Stability tests. Can your vert self right? Effects of gyro forces on the drive. Never spin up a weapon outside of a test box without the chassis securely held in place. If you must do so, never do so with the plane of the weapon in line with yourself, and do not maintain a line of sight without a suitable polycarbonate barrier. Always set up and double check your failsafes. Most smartphones can film in slow mo at 120 FPS, and most newer ones can go to 240 FPS or faster. My GoPro Hero 8, believe it or not, can also film at only 240 FPS maximum, but it can do this at 1080p, which is probably a higher resolution and clearer footage than your phone allows at 240 FPS. This allows for a pretty good way to time events like crossing a box or driving a set distance, which obviously lets you measure the top speed and acceleration with relative ease. I tried to use a free physics application that lets you track objects in a video in order to get even more useful data here. I got it to work sorta well for a clip with Draconid, and it also mostly worked for Division as well, but the app is super old and buggy as hell on Windows 10, and even with compatibility mode for Windows XP or 7, it didn't help at all. Ultimately, I got the data exported from Draconid, but not Division, and you can see here how I could easily turn this into a graph of acceleration and velocity over time. I'm sure there are many other apps that do this too and are probably better for it, so I might make a follow-up when I find one that works well with a modern PC. Anything that spins slower than 240 times per second, which is 14,400 RPM, 
you can pretty easily determine the rotation speed of using a smartphone camera at 240 FPS. If you place a marker on a robot's wheel, you should be able to count how many revolutions it completes and how many frames, and use a little math to determine the rotations per second and then RPM of that wheel. Any bot with wheels going over 5000 RPM is pretty nuts, so this probably works amazingly well for drivetrain speeds. However, with weapon speeds, particularly at the insect scale with speeds over 14,000 RPM, this becomes a bit harder. You can, however, buy a $15 laser decometer, which will easily read up to 99,000 RPM. This isn't very safe to use on a spinning metal weapon, but at least it will let you verify your motor's real-world KV, or you could use a plastic printed mock weapon and measure that. The top speed of the weapon is going to be limited by air resistance more than the weapon's inertia, so this should be reasonably accurate. I most definitely film my testing more than most, as I film probably more than 80% of the time when I'm testing, just in case I want to rewatch the video for some useful insight. This is because I'm aware that human brains are much more forgetful than the SD card in my camera or the flash storage on my phone. When it comes to benchmarking motors, there's only so much you can do with a sub $30 power meter and a camera. Inevitably, you will miss spikes, and there isn't a good way to produce repeatable torque that isn't all or nothing. For a very long time now, I've been working on a DIY Arduino-powered measurement device that I eventually hope to turn into essentially a motor dyno, with fast enough voltage and current measurements to truly find and graph the peak draw from the motor, and reliably measure the torque and mechanical power output as well. I'm only about 75% of the way there on the electronics side, however, and none of the mechanics are built, so maybe in a few months. What about failure? This is a bit trickier to do in a safe manner and without just completely destroying your robot. I've seen some builders recommending doing tests such as throwing your robot into the floor or dropping it off a balcony and seeing if it breaks, and then improving the parts that broke. While this might technically work, it's an incredibly inconsistent and erratic way to test and almost guarantees shock loads in ways that a real fight won't produce. Plus, it doesn't give you much useful data. After all, making a part beefier often makes it heavier, and if you are already at the weight limit, what do you do then? The goal of failure analysis is not to tell if something is strong enough to withstand a large hit in a fight. Predicting the exact forces involved in a combat robot is a fool's errand because you have to make ridiculous amounts of assumptions about unknowable things. The real goal is to determine how strong it is, and hopefully provide some insight into how strong it needs to be. For instance, if I thread a screw into plastic versus with a metal nut, and I pull out the screw measuring the force with both, you can imagine I'll definitely find a metal nut is stronger, but that wasn't really up for debate. The question is, will that not be necessary or not? Could the weight that I would put into that metal nut be put to better use? Often getting accurate measurements for forces or torques and failure loads will require very expensive, complex equipment that's impractical to buy and involved to build. You could measure something like the pull-out force on a screw using a simple crane scale, but beyond that, it can be pretty tricky. I like to watch videos and read articles about tests many others have done, quantifying the strength differences between 3D printing materials, orientations, wall thicknesses, etc., to best judge how to optimize my parts rather than breaking them myself. CNC Kitchen has a huge range of videos just like these. With electrical components, it's much easier to bring a part to its breaking point, but harder to do it in a way that you learn something. You can up the voltage to a speed controller till it fails, and you now know the limit, kind of. Maybe it lasted 5 seconds at 20 volts, but it would only last 60 seconds at 18 volts, and there's no way to know until you try that as well. A motor might smoke at 50 amps after 10 seconds, but that doesn't mean it'll hold up forever at 40 amps. Thermal considerations become a huge factor with electronics. This all gets very messy, but the best you can usually do is test the closest that you can to the scenario inside your robot, and if the part lasts long enough, you're good to go. I hope you all aren't too upset over Norwalk, but I'll just have to find other things to make videos about for the next couple months. I've already got a few side projects in the works, and I'll definitely be making several videos about those. My next two videos will most likely be the other two I asked about last week since several people wanted to see all three, with the Pit Table Essentials video being next on my list. If there are other topics you want me to cover, let me know in the comments, and be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Thanks for watching!